Can you tell me when? when... Yeah, two more minutes. So Zoom folks, Just talking to Zoom for the moment. Can you hear me, Zoom? Can I get a chat or can I get a heads up or thumbs up from Zoom? They may not be at their computers. But you're currently muted, so they can't hear you. Zoom, can you hear me? Zoom, can you wave and... Yes, we can hear you. Can you ask them, Andrew? Um, should I ask them? I don't care which... Okay. They can um, see Andrew. Oh, they can see Andrew. Okay, okay. Andrew, you should do it. Because they see you. Oh, so you're on mute me? Yeah, can you just ask them if they can hear you? Can you guys hear me? On Zoom? Anybody? Uh oh. Can you hear me? Touch your ear. Oh yeah, maybe touch your ears like that so they know. Uh, you've got me on a far view. Uh -huh. Yeah, the camera's on there. Yes, we can hear you, but it's staticky. What's that? Can you make him closer, uh, Long Took? It's staticky, but it's okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh okay. So somebody just gave her a thumbs oh, up. It's Karen Randall. Oh, that's good. So, can people in Zoom hear me? Yes. Well, uh -huh. they can hear me. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, um, Welcome, everybody. Welcome here. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm going to be giving our talk today, um, and we will get started with uh, opening prayers. begin our prayers, praise to Shakyamuni Yimuni Buddha, and uh, the screen share will be available shortly. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, 
ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate, endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in time enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jewel mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O oh, my masters, my dams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Adam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Nuyatiyami. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. 
In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, excuse me, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared one time all together and then 20 times to ourselves. Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate bodhisoha. Tayata gate gate par gate par sam gate bodhisoha. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagata does rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. Um, again, welcome everybody. Welcome in Zoom land. Um, my name is Andrew. I am a, a refuge sangha member here at Lions Roar. And I wanted to talk to you today about addiction uh, from a Buddhist perspective. Um, my last talk was on chronic pain in the Dharma. Um, and in my professional life, one of the things that I do is work in a chronic pain and addiction clinic. And so um, for this talk, I thought I'd talk about the other half of what I do, which is to help people with addiction. Um, and as I was preparing this talk, I, I really realized how much this isn't just a, a professional interest of mine, but also a very much of a personal interest. Um, I would say that, that most people in the field um, either have a, a personal or family history of addiction. And the family history is certainly true for me. Um, I never met my grandfather. Um, he died of cirrhosis of the liver before I was born. My, uh, his son, my uncle, died in a uh, DUI car accident. 
a single vehicle accident, fortunately, um, when I was nine years old. My father um, has uh, neuropathy in his feet from heavy drinking, so he quit alcohol around the age of 60. But I think that his uh, dementia is uh, at least in part alcohol related. Um, my aunt, uh, I'll stop here in a minute. <laughs> my aunt um, uh, converted to Mormonism at the age of 21, in part because um, the clean living lifestyle of the Mormon faith appealed to her um, as she was well on her way to alcoholism at that time. Um, being as it was, uh, she remained a devout Mormon her entire life, but addiction found her in the form of chronic pain pills. Um, Elise, we just had the seven year anniversary of her passing from a drug overdose dose at the age of 23. So you can see that addictions pretty much ravaged my family. Um, it is a not at all unique to me, of course. Um, um, the, a few statistics 46% of adults in the United States report some substance issues in their family. So that's nearly one in two adults who's, who's addressed this or had to deal with this in a personal or familial way. And I'm sure that's certainly true for many of you here. Um, a few more statistics just from the pandemic. Um, you know, addiction has been an issue in all societies throughout time. Um, but right now we're in a, in a uniquely challenging time. There's been a 31% increase in alcohol consumption, a 29% increase in drug consumption since this time and addiction overdoses are skyrocketing due in part to uh, increased isolation. Um, a little silver lining is adolescent substance use has gone down by about 30% in this during the pandemic. So we'll take that and hope that, that it stays to some degree. So um, maybe it's understandable that I gravitated toward trying to understand and, and help people with addictions, um, in part because I've not been able to help some of the people in my own family. Um, it's a very misunderstood condition, uh, oftentimes very poorly treated by the people that uh, people go to for treatment. Um, at the hospital I work at, um, a point of contact for a lot of people with addictions is um, the hospital. Right, um, their addiction leads to serious health consequences. And these people have a, um, a phrase that's used um, by the medical doctors, and they're called frequent flyers, because um, they come and go often for the same thing. They, they help you know, patch the patient up and they send them out and their addiction leads them right back to the same place until one day they don't come back. Um, fortunately, we do now have a substance use navigator um, they say that in addiction, the hallmark of addiction is denial of the consequences of use. And um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to deny the consequences when you're laying in a hospital bed, right? Um, but it's pretty amazing. People will go out, you know, they'll say, oh my god, I really want help. Um, yes, I will go to treatment tomorrow. And they don't go because the addiction uh, has taken back over. It's that powerful. So I, I'm humbled by the power of addiction. Um, so I'm going to talk you know, at the first part here just a little bit more about addiction itself, and then I want to get into um, what it, how it all relates into Buddhism. So there's there's kind of four main treatments uh, that we look at um, for addiction, and the, the four categories are bio, psycho, social, spiritual. So the biological would be um, the main form of that right now is uh, what's called medication-assisted treatment. Um, there are some medications that, there are some substances that have medications that help to curb the craving of them. For example, methadone and suboxone for opioids, naltrexone for alcohol. Um, there are certain substances where there are no known medications to help, such as methamphetamine, cocaine. Uh, so it's, we're very fortunate to have uh, medicines that can help someone to not feel the compelling urge to use so much. They, they have, as long as they're taking their medication, those cravings, those physiological cravings are much, much better. However, it's not enough because all four of those domains really have to be addressed. So the second one is psychological. Um, 
there's a very common co-occurrence with addiction and um, mental health issues. Um, sometimes it starts before the addiction, for example, trauma, um, and uh, the person starts using substances to kind of self-medicate, as we call it. They, they're trying to numb their trauma, their, their feelings about the trauma. Uh, and then, as you can imagine, when someone's using, um, at some point, their life starts to spin out of control, and they're put in the situations where they're, they're traumatizing in various ways. Um, and physiologically, it's uh, unscientifically burning out the, the pleasure chemicals in the brain so that in order to feel any, any positivity at all in their life, they have to use. And that's the point of diminishing returns. So they, you see people getting very depressed, very anxious um, when they've been using substances for a long period of time. So um, mental health treatment, which is sometimes psychotherapy, sometimes medications, is also a component of addiction treatment. The third form of treatment is social. So we biopsychosocial. Social is um, when you're using up to a certain point, pretty much everyone in your life is using along with you. That, that becomes your peer group. Uh, that's your community, if you will. So uh, if you're going to get sober, you have to give up that community, right? Uh, and what do you do? I mean, we're, we're social creatures. We need other people. Um, and so if you go back to your friends and say, I'm not going to use, and then pretty soon peer pressure is going to get to you, and, and they're going to draw you right back in. So social support often comes in the form of, for example, self-help groups. Um, the most famous one that everyone knows about is AA, NA, all the anonymouses, cocaine anonymous, pills anonymous. Um, by far, that's the most common one. There's other forms of social support as well, uh, what we call secular forms like Smart Recovery, Life Ring, Secular Organization for Sobriety. Um, there's actually a Buddhist oriented recovery uh, called Refuge Recovery. I don't know if anyone's been to that. I've never personally been to it, so I, I, I can't speak too much about it, but kind of researching it a little bit online, it appears to be pretty meditation focused, med meditation heavy. Um, so if someone wants to talk about that, who has any experience, I'd be happy to hear that. Um, we also do have a um, recovery support group, two of them here at Lions Roar. One is online and one is at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Um, do you know when the online one is, Patty? They're both, they're both at 9. They're both at 9, okay. Yeah, so that everybody goes online or Is the online one, isn't it a separate from the? It is. Yeah, okay. It is. So, um, and Lama, our Lama teaches uh, or, or facilitates the nine o'clock uh, live one. Yes, Patty. I think I should mention uh, the uh, online ones every week and the in-person ones. Every other week, gotcha, thank you. Um, and then uh, finally, we have spiritual support. And this is gonna lead me into um, you know, what I'm talking about vis-a-vis -vis Buddhism. So there's a couple of studies I wanna uh, kind of relate. One is uh, that people entering addiction treatment show lower levels of spiritual involvement than the general population. And secondly, there is an inverse relationship between substance use and the practice of meditation, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, endorsement for meditation, right? Going back to people entering addiction treatment with low levels of spiritual involvement, um, when we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, the first level is kind of safety, meeting your biological needs. I think that's where addiction, people with addictions are. Um, they're just trying to, to meet that neurological craving for the substance. So the top of Maslow's hierarchy is self-actualization, which includes kind of spiritual uh, pursuits. So you can see like there's, there's several rungs before the person gets to that. So people that get into uh, sobriety are pretty far removed from uh, having a spiritual sense of things. Um, in the addiction, in twelve step, they talk about addiction being a spiritual disease, and uh, there's talk of coming to believe that there's a higher power that can restore you to sanity. The twelfth step is um, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. We tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. 
there's a definition of the 12 steps um, from William Miller, who's one of the gurus of treating addiction. He says, 12 steps are a path that is an emergent process of character development that involves intertwining physical, psychological, and spiritual changes. So it's, it's really, um, when we look at sobriety, sobriety is just not using. Recovery is making all of these transformations uh, because at the point that you stop using, you're a pretty miserable human being. Um, and if you just stop, you're going to be miserable and sober. There's a lot of work to be done to help you to get to um, a much more fulfilled place in life and, and changing your, your entrenched patterns of behavior that will lead you right back to using. And if, if not that, at least be miserable. So that's the idea behind the 12 steps. And there's a lot of spiritual um, elements within the 12 steps. Um, a lot of people um, that don't want to do 12 step talk about um, being turned off because it seems to be so Christian. Um, there's a lot, certainly there is a lot of God talk, as they say, in the 12 steps. Um, they, talk, they do the Lord's Prayer at the end of every meeting. Um, and just a quick little aside, um, the reason that I think it's so Christian is that the founders of AA were Christian. It was founded in the 1930s, and um, they haven't changed the language pretty much since then. So if you look at like the big book, it's in very flowery 1930s language, and um, it's one of the, these institutions that has really resisted any kind of updating, if you will. So um, you'll, you'll see a lot of that Christian tradition within AA, but they've, I think they've done, they tried to do some work to make it more ambiguous. For example, um, step two is came to believe a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Um, so that's the higher power. Um, step three, oh, interestingly, on, on the higher power, does anyone know what the original higher power was? for Bill W., who was one of the co-founders, uh, hallucinogens. Um, so th this is going to tie into, if I have time, I'm going to talk at the end of my talk about um, this book by Michael Pollan that kind of relates to all this. But uh, he had an experience with Belladonna um, that gave him this perspective uh, beyond his addiction that um, they said it fundamentally changed him. And he tried to advocate um, that LSD be used um, as the higher power, but he was shot down by the board of Alcoholics Anonymous at that point because they thought it was not good branding. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and as we'll come to see that that's, uh, although there may be value there, it's not the only way to get that higher power uh, and, and that uh, ability to kind of see beyond small, small mind. So, um, and then step three, we came to, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to God as we understood him. So that's where you, you're able to bring in more of what you want. Uh, for many people, that's still not enough. They, they need to feel something. Like there are atheist and agnostic 12-step groups. But what's interesting is there's 12-step groups across all the world's major religions. Uh, they've, they've adopted the 12 steps. And the uh, Lama is actually... Uh, adapted the 12 steps. And I think they're, they're really good, and I want to read them just for a minute because I think it's important to hear them. So step one, the truth of suffering. We experienced the truth of our addictions. Our lives were unmanageable suffering. Step two, the truth of the origin of suffering. We admit that we craved for and grasped onto addictions as our refuge. Step three, the truth of the end of suffering. We came to see that complete cessation of craving and clinging at addictions is necessary. Step four, the truth of the path. We made a decision to follow the way of liberation and to take refuge in our wakefulness, our truth, and our fellowship. Step five, right view. We made a searching and fearless review of our life. We are willing to acknowledge and proclaim our truth to ourselves, another human being, and the community. Step six, right thought. We are mindful that we create the causes for suffering and liberation. Our goodness is indestructible. Step seven, right speech. We purify, confess, and ask for forgiveness straightforwardly and without judgment. We are willing to forgive others. 
Step eight, right action. We make a list of all persons we harm and are willing and able to actively make amends to them all, unless to do so would be harmful. Step nine, right livelihood. We simplify our lives, realizing we are all interconnected. We select a vocation that supports our recovery. Step 10, right effort. We realize that continuing to follow this path, no matter what, is joyful effort. Step 11, right mindfulness. Through prayer, meditation, and action, we will follow the path of kindness, being mindful moment by moment. Step 12, right concentration. Open to the spirit of awakening as a result of these steps, we will carry this message to all people suffering with addictions. Does anybody recognize the pattern that's there? The, uh, the um, Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path, right? So, um, so as you can see, I, I've always been really um, taken by the, uh, the 12 steps, how much, so much of it relates to Buddhism as I see it. But then again, everything relates to Buddhism as I see it these days. <laughs> so, um, but this is where I kind of want to diverge and, and discuss um, how addiction relates to the Dharma. Um, and my sources for this part are um, Darshan Muthlama, um, Alexander Berzin, Rigpa Wiki, and uh, Michael Pollan, uh, a little bit from his book. So um, we'll start with the three poisons, um, which are the root, are seen as the root of our suffering and what, what keeps us rooted in samsara. Um, the first of the three poisons is attachment, um, of which uh, grasping and clinging are subsets of attachment. Addiction is certainly a form of grasping and clinging to sense pleasures. Lama says that um, with addiction, uh, it starts with the person first grasping at feeling good. That's why someone takes the substance they want to feel good, obviously. Um, and then it's to not feel bad uh, because one of the insidious aspects of substances is um, that the more you take, the less benefit you get. Um, it's partly, it's known as tolerance. Um, so you never can get that first high back. And uh, again, you get just diminishing returns. And so uh, at some point, uh, you're really just taking it not to feel bad all the time. Um, and then finally, he says um, that the person is just taking substances to feel numb. Um, so it's kind of an insidious, horrible decline that we see with people. Um, so clinging is the ninth causal link in, in the 12 links of dependent origination, as we uh, learned recently from Lama's talks. Clinging is dependent upon craving before it can exist. Uh, with craving as a condition, clinging arises. So I want to read to you the sixth through the ninth links of the links of dependent origination. Uh, number six is contact. This is Rigpa Wiki here. The coming together of objects, sense faculty, and consciousness is contact. Seventh link, sensation. From contact arises sensation, pleasurable, painful, and neutral. The eighth is craving. There then develops a desire not to be separated from pleasurable sensations and to be free from painful sensations. Nine, I'm sorry, eight is grasping. As craving increases, it develops into grasping, i.e. actively striving never to be separated from what is pleasurable and to avoid what is painful. And then the, the ninth link is becoming. Through this grasping, one acts with body, speech, and mind and creates the karma that determines one's next existence. So hopefully you can kind of see uh, addiction here. So that grasping and, and clinging to sense pleasures that in a sense we all want, right? I mean, this isn't just about addiction to substances. It's, uh, it's anything that we're, we're grasping at. Um, we can have addictions um, to all sorts of behaviors. Um, not, and again, this is, you know, I think it's important. Um, substances can be extreme because of what they do to the brain. Uh, but 
addictions come in many, many forms. And I think you know, in many ways we all have our various addictions. Um, and I think that that really is, we're looking at the, uh, the 12 links, it's one of the reasons that we have the precept of avoiding mind-altering substances is it takes us on a potential path of craving and grasping and creation of negative karma as a result. Um, so I want to kind of talk a bit about karma and how this relates to addiction. And this is where I'm going to rely on Alexander Burrs in a bit and apologize for doing uh, some reading, but he says it so much better than me. So he says there's two explanations of karma. One refers to the compelling mental urges that draw us into various actions, whether saying, doing, or thinking. The other explanation is regard to our verbal and physical actions. Karma is the compulsive shape of the physical actions, the compulsive sound of our verbal actions, and the compelling subtle energy that accompanies both types of actions and continues afterwards with our mental continuum. Once we act on these compulsive karmic manners, it leaves certain types of karmic aftermath on our mental continuums. These karmic potentials and tendencies give rise to karmic ripening when sufficient conditions are present. One of these results is our general feeling of some level of happiness or unhappiness accompanying each moment of our experience. Unhappiness is a result of destructive behavior and happiness is a result of constructive behavior. Also, there is a feeling to repeat a previous type of action. From this feeling arises an urge to actually do it that draws us into the action. So the feeling creating the urge. To deal with what we experience in life, we must have some cultivation of attentiveness and awareness. In the West, when the object of our attention is what is happening in any given moment, it is known as mindfulness. As we cultivate this mindful awareness, we are more able to be attentive to what is going on in our mental and emotional lives, and more able to see when our feelings lead to urges. There begins to open up a space between our feeling like doing something and the compelling urge that brings us to that behavior. I don't know if any of you all have noticed that with your meditation, how it's maybe created a space for you between what you think and how you act on that thought. That's certainly true for me. And um, one of my absolute favorite quotes that I heard for the first time from Ellen uh, is from psychiatrist um, Viktor Frankl. Between stimulus and response lies a space. In that space lies our freedom and power to choose a response. In our response lies our growth and our happiness. So, you know, if we can arrest the feeling to the urge, to the, the compulsion to act on that urge, then we have a chance. So back to Dr. Burzen. Our habits are, car are kar karmic tendencies which have ripened from this lifetime or from previous lifetimes. Because we have a precious human rebirth, we don't have to act without any control over our instincts like animals. We have the ability to discriminate between what is helpful and what is harmful. We don't want to mindlessly cause ourselves more problems. Therefore, we try to overcome compulsively acting on bad habits. We have to think of our habits as addictions. In this way, we are not separate from the person with drug addiction. Our addictions may be gambling, sex, eating, internet, and phones, or just how we treat other people. The first step in any addiction program is an admission that one is an addict. Dr. Burzen says this is a necessary step in order to eliminate the problem. Similarly, we must admit our compulsive tendencies to be able to overcome them. Dr. Burzen then points out that a great many addiction programs can lead people to believe that being an addict is their true and unchanging identity and that no one can truly ever get over being an addict. You, you hear when you go to a 12 step meeting, hi, my name is Andrew, and I'm, I'm an alcoholic. So there's an identification with, with uh, that label. Um, I understand where that's coming from um, because uh, the thing that people most want when they have an addiction is to go back to regular using. And uh, it's just not possible. Um, for, I mean, maybe someone could do it for a period of time, but uh, we have many, many examples of people who maintain some sobriety for some time, and then when they go back out and use, 
they go back out much, much worse and maybe end up killing themselves. So I think it's a valuable way for people to look at it, but it definitely diverges from how Buddhism looks at it. Uh, Dr. Burzen says that from a Buddhist point of view, we can, we can achieve a true stopping of all of our addictions, including habits, so that they never arise again. This is our aim as Buddhist practitioners. Um, and certainly we're not about um, clinging to a fixed and solid sense of I. And, uh, uh, we, we are uh, always changing. So it's, that can be a valuable way of looking at it. So this is where uh, renunciation comes in for overcoming our addictive patterns or uh, to compulsive behavior. Renunciation is the determination to be free of something and the willingness to give it up. The emotional feeling involved with it is total disgust and boredom. We are just bored with our behavioral addictions, whether they are self-destructive negative addictions or neurotic positive ones. Um, I've heard Lama say this before, like uh, we have to get to a point with whatever is challenging us, like I'm just done with this. I'm sick of it. I, it just needs to stop. So I'm going to pause here and see if there's any comments or questions before I kind of move on. Yes. I don't think it's a Well, maybe you can just repeat. Okay. Um, I wasn't quite following what you were saying there towards the end. That um, were you saying that the view outside of Buddhism is addictions are ourselves, and that Buddhism attempts to separate, to, to make us recognize that there isn't a self, so the addiction isn't a self. Is that what you, is that what that was? That's, well, that was my implication, actually, from what Dr. Burzin was saying. Uh, so the question is, um, in, in uh, a lot of recovery, it's uh, treatment, it's about, uh, yes, I am, I'm doing that, yeah. So the, the question was um, how, like just basically to clarify, I think, how uh, Buddhism looks at identity uh, around addiction versus um, these programs like 12 step and, and things like that. And so um, maybe uh, just to clarify, um, there's something known as the disease model, um, you know, that addiction is a, is a disease, um, like diabetes or something like that, and um, that you don't cure yourself of diabetes, you can put it into remission, but it is a chronic and, uh, disease that if, the, if you have uh, Sometimes lifestyle dietary behavior changes, um, it can lead to a relapse. And so similarly with, with substances, um, you can put it in remission by um, not using, but if you relapse, then um, it's going to obviously get worse. And then there's also kind of a theory that the disease is progressing even if you're not using because um, we'll find that when people relapse after periods of time, they seem to go back worse than before. And so I think it's, it's a valuable way for people to think that I'm not cured. Just because I'm sober and I have been sober for 20 plus years, I'm not cured. So there's a, there's a fixation sometimes of an identity of I am an addict, I am an alcoholic, I cannot drink, I cannot use, ever. And, and that's what a lot of people end up needing 
uh, in order to um, kind of stay away. And that is true. You cannot use again. You cannot do it. Right? Nothing is um, absolute. Can people not use uh, and something else kill them before they relapse? That's entirely possible, right? I mean, if someone lives long enough and they relapse, then that might be what kills them. And so um, it's the, what they call a cunning, baffling, and powerful disease. And so you just don't know. I have seen people that seemed so solid in their recovery and then they relapsed. So it's, it's just like that. So it's, it's just kind of an external framework to help that person um, because ideally someone's not going to use again. Um, that's going to be ultimately probably the healthiest thing for them. Some people may be able to go back and, and use a little bit of something here and there, but it's like playing with fire. It's like that. So, um, but from the Buddhist perspective, um, we're not saying that you have this true and unchanging identity. Um, part of why we're on this path is to overcome uh, our addiction to these patterns of compulsive behavior and um, to find freedom. And we believe that, um, you know, there is freedom at the end of the path, so to speak. And so um, I think from, from a Buddhist perspective, yes, you can overcome addiction be it to substances or, or anything else. That's part of why we're on the path. So and I, I think in some ways, it kind of parallels for me, um, you know, psychotherapy and mental illness. As a therapist, I can tell you therapy is only gonna take you so far. Um, Buddhism is, can take you farther than, than therapy. So it, they're both kind of therapeutic paths, if you will, but Buddhism offers uh, complete freedom from suffering. And I think that's part of what appeals to most of us, if not all of us. So hopefully that helps answer that. Yes. I have a question. Oh, I have a microphone. And pardon oh, my. Oh. I have a question. Um, and pardon me for being naive, but it's a curious question. So in your talk, I heard you say that we, maybe, I don't know. Um, that I am an alcoholic, and that was at an anonymous, right? AA. Mm -hmm. Isn't Buddhism non attachment and non grasping? I mean, how does those two parallel? How do you do that yeah. as a, as, when you're practicing Buddhism? How, and is, how do you move from attachment and How grasping? do you move from attachment when we're supposed to say, and I'm, I don't struggle with, you know, substance abuse, um, but you say, I'm an alcoholic? That's admitting it. That's the first step, right? But then, as a Buddhist practice, with practicing also non-attachment, how did, can you talk a little bit more about that? Am I totally far I off? I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I think you know our goal is to be free from attachment and, and grasping and clinging, um, and that's the whole path of Buddhism. Um, that suffering comes from wanting what we don't have and, and not wanting to be separated from what we do have. Um, and, and those are part of the three poisons. And then there's the ignorance of how things actually exist. And so um, the Noble Eightfold Path, of the uh, Six Perfections, um, everything relates to this in, in Buddhism. Um, everything that we're doing is to lessen our, our self-clinging and um, be able to see things as they truly are and, and uncloud our minds, if you will. Um, it's a big reason meditation is such a big part of, uh, of the path. And, and, you know, meditation scientifically um, beyond Buddhism has just been shown to be so powerful at lessening that sense of um, kind of fixation on, on things. Like that. So hopefully that is a helpful short answer. I don't know if anyone wants to add anything to that. I would like to say something. I, I'm online. Online is there a Hello. question or comment? Yeah, my name is Mike Reed. I'm I'm online. Um, 
I'm new to Buddhism. I'm not new to alcoholism and, and drug addiction. Uh, I was 23 when I landed in Alcoholics Anonymous, showing signs of chronic alcoholism common in men in their 40s. And uh, I was one of those fortunate people who was able to um, quit drinking and stay quit. I was active in Alcoholics Anonymous for 25 years. Um, I still call myself an alcoholic because I'm persuaded from experience, I worked as a counselor for about 15 years, uh, that there is a metabolic disorder that I have. And it's just something that's wired into me the way that my kidneys and, and brain are wired into me. And that I'm reminded by saying I'm an alcoholic that um, I can't accidentally drink. I can't, I have to be careful not to uh, simply take a drink of something at a party and think that I'm safe because the way that I put it is that my liver reads molecules, it doesn't read my intentions. And, and I think that that may help to, to clarify the perspective of the alcoholic who says I'm an alcoholic. It's not so much an attachment as a cautionary label just to say I have a peculiar metabolism that doesn't, that prevents, that precludes me from safely drinking ever again. Now, I, like I said before, I, I've been almost 50 years without a drink. And uh, it's because of what I learned in AA, even though I haven't been active for about 25 years. And uh, just thought I'd share that with you. Is that Mike? Yes. Mike, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. And um, um, I have so much respect for um, what the 12 step program has done for so many people. Um, it's really saved countless lives. And I think um, just what I was thinking as you were talking is um, we have conventional self and then ultimate view. And I think we still have to kind of exist in conventional world. And so we, we might be able to parse it with conventional I um, is an alcoholic that has to uh, not take a drink when I'm at this party, uh, but not to stop there with Buddhism. It's, it's uh, looking at ultimate view and carrying both like the like Lama says, two rails of, of the of the tracks. Yes. So that that is is why I'm I'm now attending a Buddhist service. There was there was more to life than than just not drinking and practicing the the twelve steps as I could. Yes, so, yes, yeah, for sure. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay, um, hopefully uh, you guys can bear with me. I want to talk about um, some stuff that I've been reading fairly recently that has just absolutely fascinated me and, and how it relates, I think, to all of this. So about six months ago, I, I picked up this book called How to Change Your Mind uh, by the author Michael Pollan, who's written some other, he's a journalist, um, and it was about... Um, how there's been an increasing interest in using psychedelics uh, for various uh, things, uh, some of which are end of life anxiety for cancer patients. Uh, but more interestingly to me as a, as a mental health practitioner is how it's uh, potentially going to revolutionize the field of mental health with uh, treatment for um, conditions that are, are so hard to treat, uh, including addiction. And so um, I don't necessarily want to talk so much about the actual psychedelic part of it today, but um, some of the neuroscience that I learned in the book. Um, so there's some theories as to, but to start with psychedelics, there's some theories as to why they seem to provide a powerful quick result across a lot of problems like depression, anxiety, addiction, obsessive compulsive disorder. So there's a um, physician, former FDA chief, David Kessler, who wrote um, in, in a book, um, he argues that there's a common mechanism underlying addiction 
depression, anxiety, obsessions, and mania. He posits that all of these involve learned habits of negative thinking and behavior that hijack our attention and trap us in loops of self-reflection. What started as a pleasure becomes a need. What was once a bad mood becomes continuous self-indictment. What was once an annoyance becomes persecution. In a process he describes as a form of inverse learning. Quote, every time we respond to a stimulus, we strengthen the neural circuitry that prompts us to repeat the same destructive thoughts or behaviors. And I read that and it sounds just like what I was talking about with karma, right? Um, so there's an area in the brain that scientists have discovered over the last 20 years that they, that they term the default mode network. I'm going to get wonky for a second, but I think it, it relates to Buddhism. So uh, bear with me. Um, and by, if I have Patty and Lama's permission, since I, I take copious notes, I will transcribe this and you can publish it in the Roar or something if, if it feels like I'm going too far into um, science land. <laughs> uh, so this area, the default mode network, is uh, where it's believed that um, our felt sense of self is. So um, when Lama says, where is the I? You can say the default mode network, oh. <laughs> <laughs> or the the imputed sense of I is in the def <laughs> default mode network, right? That's where uh, the, it's an organizational structure in the brain that, because there's so much kind of chaos coming in um, with different sensory inputs, it organizes into a coherent framework, and so it allows us to kind of operate in the world, uh, learn from our mistakes, plan for the future. So it's a very necessary um, kind of operational system, if you will. Uh, the problem is um, for it, it's a lot of where our thinking and figuring things out is happening. And um, it's especially active when um, there's nothing else going on. So when we're sitting and just daydreaming and thinking is when the default mode network is, is working. And, and what they find is that people with depression and addictions and, and these uh, ruminative disorders, if you will, have overactive default mode networks. Um, they're just they're going down these neural pathways over and over and strengthening those neural pathways, right? And when we talk about the karma that, that we create and those habits, and the, every all of us have these habits that we just feel like stuck in. That's the default mode network, according to the, the neuroscientist that's doing that. And so um, what they have found with um, psychedelics is that the default mode network um, is suppressed when the person is on under the influence of the psychedelic and they start to report very frequently a, a dissolution of their ego and sense of self and their, their separateness and they, they feel like they're becoming much more connected with everything and everyone and, and the universe at large and um, that whole sense of self just begins to slip away, if you will. And um, when they come back, they, they often have a different perspective on their, um, their problems. They, it's like the problems seem a little bit farther away. Like I was saying we, we, earlier, you have to get kind of bored with, I'm just done with this, I'm bored with it. A lot of them would say that, like, my addiction's boring to me. I just don't want to live like that anymore. And maybe that's what uh, Bill W. experienced when he did the, bell, the Belladonna. Is, um, it's like a, a, a kind of a, an airplane view of the issue. When you're just down in it, it's so much harder to get that. And so that quieting of the default mode network is, um, seems to be a key to helping people. So there's another way, not that I'm endorsing psychedelics. I don't think we're there yet as a, as a, as a field uh, to be able to endorse it. it someday, maybe. But uh, there's just not enough science uh, and research as of yet. There's another way to quiet the default mode network that's near and dear to Buddhists. <laughs> Do you guys know what it is? Meditation. And actually, I'm just kind of curious about something. I, I, this would be a great research study, is um, guru yoga, right? Because in guru yoga, we're um, taking ourselves to a very different place 
um, we're imagining ourselves as the guru. It's like we're, we're dissolving ourselves into this deity. And it's very imaginative and very, it's almost hallucinogenic if you want to, if you want to think of it that way. So um, I don't think you have to take a psychedelic. There's a lot of placebo with psychedelics. If you think it's going to help you, it's going to help you. Right? Everything is, is the mind, the power of the mind. And so if you believe uh, that you are the deity, you will become the deity. So I, I really wonder if uh, they would do some, because they're doing a lot of fMRI stuff with um, seasoned Buddhist monks and, and finding all this fascinating stuff. I'd, I'd love to see what they might do with Tantra. Um, so it, I was also curious, maybe if one of the reasons that people are using drugs and alcohol is it temporarily quiets the default mode network, right? Because that, that uh, overthinking everything is a miserable place to be. We all know what that feels like. Um, it's part of what, again, what we love, I love about meditation oops, is um, you put a space between all the thoughts and they just, you just watch them instead of being sucked under by them like that. So, um, so uh, let's just kind of move it back to Buddhism for a minute. Um, Michael Pollan says, um, when the ego dissolves, so does a bounded conception, not only of ourself, but of our self-interest. What emerges in place is invariably a broader, more open-hearted and altruistic, that is more spiritual idea of what matters in life. Uh, again, just thinking of addiction, it's, it's all about me, me, me. Like, um, what am I going to do to get the substance? Um, being high on the substance and recovering from the effects of the substance, that defines the life of someone with an addiction. It's, it's all about um, this complete self-focus. Then the 12th step in 12 steps is complete other focus, which is what I love. It's like uh, the pay it forward step. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I vow to carry this message forward to others. So that's the other focus, right? Then Pollen writes, uh, I was wondering when he was going to get to Buddhism, and he finally did, and he wrote, <laughs> Buddhists believe that attachment is at the root of all forms of suffering. If the neuroscience is right, a lot of these forms of suffering have their mooring in the posterior cingulate gyrus, that's the default mode network, where they are nurtured and sustained. Uh, this scientist, uh, Judson Brewer, thinks that by diminishing this activity, whether by means of meditation or psychedelics, we can learn to be with our thoughts and cravings without getting caught up in them. Achieving such a detachment from our thoughts, feelings, and desires is what Buddhism, along with several other wisdom traditions, teaches is the surest path out of human suffering. Sounds pretty great, right? Um, but something didn't quite sit right for me um, when I read that, and it's the idea of detachment as the pathway out of suffering. Because I don't think that's the Vajrayana path. I think um, we're not about kind of detachment. So I was asking Lama about this in, in Darshan, and he kind of explained it to me. So um, kind of walk through what he's told me. Theravada says desire itself is the problem. These are different schools of Buddhism. Mahayana says addiction is the desire for misperceived objects. We're thinking that certain things will bring more pleasure than they do and that that pleasure will be lasting. So we continue to grasp at that thing as it goes away. Tantra is about learning to self-generate bliss states through guru yoga instead of external generation through substances or whatever we do. Tantra is saying that it all could be generated internally. We could be in the desert with no supplies around and still self-generate bliss states. Lamala says that Tantra is learning how to have desire correctly. He says samsara is misunderstanding desire. We're in the desire realm in samsara. In Mahayana, we need desire, just correctly understood desire. He says other schools could be anorexic about dealing with desire. Suppressing desire can lead to an alexithymic mindset. Alexithymia is a term for uh, devoid, being devoid of emotion. Um, and Lama says that in addiction, that's the, the goal. Remember, he said first you don't you use because you want to feel good, then you use because you don't want to feel bad, 
and then you use because you don't want to feel anything, right? So complete opposite of what we're after in, in Tantra. The Mahayana point of view regarding addiction would be that people misunderstand reality to think that compounded things can bring permanent happiness that we can count on. For the substance user, the feeling is that people and situations are unpredictable, but the substance is always there. The methods of feeling happy are reliable, um, is what the, the person with addiction feels. Uh, we feel it's the one thing we can count on. Um, I certainly see this in my work with people with opioid addictions. Um, the physiological dependence and the psychological dependence that, that occurs with it. Uh, people feel like nothing else will help them. Um, they might start with a pain issue and then they feel like, uh, what's wrong with you? Why are you trying to take my opioid away? It's the only thing that helps me. And they can't see any other way out of it. So um, uh, again, the hallmarks of addiction um, beyond denial are, are uh, tolerance and withdrawal. So you need more and more of that same result and you feel worse after the substance leaves your system. The Lama says addiction is a jealous God. It takes all the other sources of happiness and pleasure away. For example, if we do methamphetamine, we're less likely to get pleasure from other sources. The feeling becomes, I've got to have this and nothing else will do. So uh, this, again, can help us to understand any compulsions, be they substances or behaviors, like food or shopping or internet or phone. Uh, I can relate to phone, I'll be honest. <laughs> That's the hard one for me. It's, uh, I can just get drawn up in it, and especially over the pandemic. Um, it was so depressing to see like, giving my amount of time on phone at the end of the week. <laughs> So I'm, I'm telling you this stuff. I'm, I'm working on it. That's all I'll say. But actually, Lama said it's important to kind of own. Uh, you know, part of this is it was in his 12 steps, but uh, he says uh, that we have to talk about the very real shame and stigma around addiction. Um, he said there's a lot of, of what he calls spiritual override in Buddhist practice. Um, it's like we feel like we can turn on some big Dharma light to realize the nature of things, but it's more that we're equipped with a flashlight and we have to turn it on and go from room to room exploring. He says that we have to look at the things that trip us up, the things that bring us to therapy. <laughs> we have to get down to those details. Um, he says it takes a lot of courage to be vulnerable and specific. So, um, this is where I'm going to stop and, and again invite anyone who wants to share anything or ask any more questions before we wrap up. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the topic is near and dear to my heart. Uh, both the uh, recovery from addiction and um, also new modalities for working with um, psychedel using psychedelics uh, to uh, help people with both addiction and other type of um, issues in their life. And one of the things that um, I've noticed in my experience with other people and myself um, with psychedelics is that they aren't good enough on their own. That even though the DNS or the de default mode network rather um, goes offline and can kind of stay subdued for a period of time, say like with psilocybin, maybe for like 30 days or more, that it gets reactivated. Even if you crush the ego, it comes right back, you know? And that the, the way to actually use them properly is to marry them to some type of, um, other work, some type of healing, whether it's therapy or spiritual practice, something else that while the, the default mode network is subdued, that's the period of time when therapy or some type of intentional um, work to improve life, your life condition, that kind of opens the possibility, but that when people just use the psychedelics and have a trip, they go right back to being themselves, the ego comes right back. Um, and I, I 
I, I feel like what you said, the, the last little bit was intriguing about um, the fact that uh, guru yoga um, could very well, you know, it, that it, there's some kind of kind of similarity there. Um, in my own experience, you know, having dropped the use of all the psychedelics, uh, what I've noticed is that um, meditative practice and a burgeoning practice, or just a, a starting practice with guru yoga, has in fact blown my mind. I was having a discussion with a friend the other day. I said it's the weirdest thing, right? I, don't do psychedelics anymore, but I still have psychedelic experience. It's something similar. It's not the same, but something on the same wavelength. So you're you're on to something there <laughs> for sure. I and so. I, I really appreciate what you talked about today. Thank well, you. Thank you. Um, so the little bit of research that we do have um, with psychedelics is um, it's there's a, a form of treatment known as psychedelic assisted therapy where you, you have a guide who helps you process the experience, right? And there's a new medication, the first new medication for depression in, in probably decades, uh, new class of medication, ketamine, which is not an old, it's an old medication that's now being used for depression. Uh, and there are some clinics that are using ketamine with kind of a, um, a therapist, not kind of, with, it, with a therapist to help you process that experience. And so you can have an experience um, but if you don't, if you don't process it and, and integrate it, it just goes right away and to your point. And that's something they're having to look at is, um, you get the dramatic result, but then it fades, you know? So Lama and I were talking about this, um, kind of an analogy. It's, it's like, um, you you want to see what's over the garden wall, the tall wall. It's like the, uh, the psychedelics are like a, a trampoline. And it bounces you up and you, and you see, and you go, wow, that's amazing. But then you come back and, and the path, the, the Buddhist path is like constructing a ladder and then climbing the ladder. And it's, it's more effortful and it's still more time consuming, but, but then you get over the wall and you stay over the wall like that. And he said it could even make some people potentially depressed to be able to see what's over there and then have to come back like that. So um, that's kind of what, it's intriguing, but it's again, I think there's other ways to do it for sure. Yes. Well, and oh, I was gonna, um, if I can add on to this, is Jack. Hi, Jack. Um, yeah, I appreciate this talk. And um, I think what was really helpful for me when I started doing a consistent meditation practice and meeting with Lama was realizing that it really is all already inside me. Um, and it's about, going on that journey um, to find it. And, you know, I, I am grateful for my psychedelic experiences in some ways, very much so. Um, but also there was a way that all of that was outside of me. I had to take the substance in order to realize some truth. Um, and so to realize that it actually is already there rather than requiring that external substance was incredibly therapeutic and empowering. So, yeah. right, you question how real is it if if it was uh, just something that was time limited and after the ingestion of something. So, I think that you know different cultures have used them in spiritual practices. Obviously, um, they're a means to an end in a sense. But they're not the end in themselves, I guess. So that's a that's. Uh, Helpful and good reminder, Jack, that um, it's all within us, it's all within the mind. And how you get there is, um, it's important to realize that, that it's not like you have to take something to get there. Anybody else? Susan? What about hypnosis? How would hypnosis play into this? Susan is asking how would hypnosis play into this? Um, that's a good question. I, I couldn't tell you exactly. I could just guess at it. Um, hypnosis is helping a person to access a uh, altered mental state, right? I mean, there's lots of different ways to, to access altered mental states. Um, holotropic breath work is another one I've heard of. 
Um, I just kind of go back to placebo. Like the power of placebo is is really compelling. Um, the idea, like a lot of um, complement, complementary medicine, they, there's, they could be all about placebo in many ways. But that doesn't. That's not to diminish it. It's to show how going maybe back to what Jack was saying, the power of the mind. It's all right there. So sometimes um, it's just how how you get there. Um, but I don't know that hypnosis in and of itself. I mean, I know that it can, it certainly helps people. I know it's used for things like smoking. I don't know about um, drug and alcohol addictions. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of, what do you call that? Default mode network. Yeah, that. Yeah. Like how it relates to the default <coughs> mode network? Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, clearly there's so much more research that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. But it's exciting, I think. Um, it's uh, fascinating to me. I'm totally intrigued. So I'd love to see where the research goes and how it, you know, I know that the Dalai Lama is very much about science proving Buddhism and he'll change Buddhism if science proves something wrong. And I love that empirical investigation. Um, Find out for yourself. And it just, it feels so connected to me. I'm surprised I didn't find more online reading about like, how this is being related to Buddhism. So it's only a matter of time, I think. Yes. Hold, hold, hold on. We're going to get the microphone. But people, people online need to hear. Oh, people online. I'm going to break out in song here. <laughs> it's on, on, on. Uh, I, now I forget my question. Um, <laughs> Can we can we consider that we transcend psychod- the pill of uh, say for instance LSD when we go into a state that's beyond depression and you take the pill you go beyond the pill and then you go beyond depression can we sure consider that pardon me oh, keep going I'm not quite following you. Um, well, my experience was that I was a, a, an extremely depressed uh, young man, and I met someone, and we did acid together, and I literally was outside of that depression, and it has stuck 50 years. I mean, I very, very seldom experience depression, and when I do, I can see it for what it is. Uh, I just wonder if we can consider we transcend the pill, which is what I feel I did. I transcended LSD in my state of, of whatever we can call it. So comments on that? Well, kind of what I would relate that to from the book is these kind of neural connections and neural pathways. Like a, an example that was given in the book is an analogy is um, a snow covered hill. And you take your sled up there and you sled down it and then you go back up and sled down it again. And, and the more you sled down the hill, the more grooves and pathways you're creating and your sled's going to want to go down the grooves and pathways because it's a smoother route. And so that's, that's the neural connections that our mind is making over time. Uh, we get fixated into certain neural connections and neural pathways. Uh, be they depression, anxiety, I mean, on a negative side of things, we would look at it that way, Um, that you you take, something happens in the world and your filter goes right to those neural pathways. And you see it from a depressive mindset, for example. So um, psychedelics, and um, it's like wiping the snow clean. But if you have all those karmic habits and tendencies, you're going to create the tracks all over again. Maybe that's why they don't tend to last, right? Maybe because you were a young man, um, this is just a guess, um, you didn't, your tracks weren't so deep and you wiped them and you were able to go down some different tracks, what I would hope would be the case. Yeah, and again, there's other ways to, to it's like maybe uh, meditation isn't wiping it clean, but slowly uh, filling in the pathways so that, that you have options to go. And, and also with Buddhism, learning, maybe I don't want to go down there. 
my meditation tells me not to go down that track, I'm going to go down this other track. And so it gives us more choices and it's, it's more of a lasting benefit, right? Like we don't see a drop off for, with meditation the way we do with, with psychedelics. That's my best thought about yeah, that. I feel that I was very fortunate that I was stuck. Um, I was so depressed that I didn't even know that I was depressed, if that makes sense. Uh, but in that moment with acid, um, well, I became, I, I was one. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I feel very, very fortunate looking back that, uh, yeah, I realized that this disappeared, but it never did. It took me out of that, more of that way. And now they're doing a lot of research in Oakland, but it's legal in Oakland, in my understanding. I don't know if that passed, I think it passed. Hmm. Uh, they're doing a lot of research with uh, guides and, uh, and, and acid, so excited. And I'm reading, I read that The Change of the Mind, and I'm reading the plant book. And caffeine is a real interesting chapter on that book, and that book is called Light Off. I mean, caffeine is, is a tough drug. There's no doubt about it. It's a very, 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 very powerful drug. And you consume it without any thought. You know, so. I'm going to have to read that book now. <laughs> yeah, I'm just finishing up the caffeine. I'm going in psilocybin. Okay. It's, uh, he's, he's a very interesting man. Yeah, absolutely. He really is. He's a foodie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was a foodie and he turned into this, you know, guru of uh of uh changing the mind. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know we're kind of starting to run late. Any last final comments or questions before we uh do closing prayers? I'm having trouble here. Oh. Uh, I don't think the mic's working the way it's Never mind. Sure. You can say it and I can repeat it if you want. Okay. And maybe you said this before, this, the mindful recovery program here includes uh, Didi Yoga, does it include Medicine Buddha? Medicine Buddha. Medicine Buddha. Uh, the mindful recovery includes Medicine Buddha practice. That's the what, question what and answer. Medicine, medicine Buddha is a form of deity yoga. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, good. And uh, any further questions, please direct them to Lama. He can <laughs> certainly help you. <laughs> I'll remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take my word for it. Take his word for it. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and do closing prayers. Do you want me to do them if the microphone's not working? Or do you want to just take this? Um, you can do them, but could you announce uh, people to you? Here, here. You'll be better. Hey. Howdy. Yes. I have a quick announcement also first. Um, oh, okay. Just after service, uh, I'm going to keep the Zoom room opened uh, and the room opened, and we're just going to have a little Q&A if people have questions about Lions Works, we're opening up. Um, so I'll be around to answer questions um, and just sort of have a little social time if we want, um, just for a few minutes. Um, and we're going to sort of start that each week for a couple minutes right after the talk. So um, that's all I have. Okay, <laughs> so um, thank you for that announcement. I just wanted to mention that, you know, since we're so many of us are online now, we uh, we have this donor box here in person, but because uh, our friends are online, thankfully we have that chance. There's a kind of like a donor box online. I, I believe like there might be a Venmo link or something like that. And it really helps us so much, even just a little donation on a regular basis helps us so much. So. If you're able to, uh, we would so appreciate it. And then um, the other announcement is that on Monday, Lama Jimpa is teaching um, uh, at seven o'clock. And that's just a really amazing opportunity to have a teacher uh, like Lama Jimpa that um, is a Westerner that understands our, our the way we are and, and that we can talk to and he understands where we're coming from. So that's Monday at seven. And uh, then the last thing I wanted to mention was that Lama, oh, he tells me because uh, I, I'm, I guess, one of those people that learn slow. And maybe he, he says this to me since I met him, actually, that turtles win the race. That's what he tells me. <laughs> and so I just want to mention that for all the turtles out there. So, so.
Oh, okay. Um, so we'll do dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chanrizik Tenzin Gyatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Losang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, and I'll see you guys soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye in Zoom land. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Bye Zoomers. So, uh, Zoomers, if you want to stick around and chat or learn more about uh, Lion's Roar, if you have questions, f please feel free to do so. Um, I'm going to keep the room open and move to the front. Do you happen to have a pen? Uh, I do not have a pen, no. Okay, I can just leave the uh, two lions were blank, right? On my check. Um, yeah, Patty might have some pen or something. Who? But Susan Fra right there. Hi, Susan. Hello. Would you happen to have a yeah probably hey zoom so you guys can go ahead and talk um room so if you guys have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, ask. I'm Tenzin Luntuk. Um, I'm uh, the youngest monk here at Lion's Roar. Um, the, well, we've got Geshe Damsho. Geshe Damsho is our resident teacher. He is also a monk. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions or if you guys just want to get to know sort of who's around here. Um, I'm happy to help out with that. There are only three live people on here. The rest are all my my admin um, things. I'll give you a few minutes in case you wander away to get some water or something. Do you have any questions? Do you want to stay hang out? I mean, sometimes we chit chat. I'm fine. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah, waiting for another class. Well, I was just talking to Daniel about that. Um, I'm kind of, we're thinking about starting another one. Would you be interested? Sure. Yeah. Lacey? I, I, uh, where is there a meditation group? Did you forget to log off? Or you, do you want to talk? Okay. You're the only one. No, so oh, you're gone. Okay. Is, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, long -term. Okay. So Thursday, what time? Six. 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 Oh, so they're both. Yeah. 
6 p.m. Good. Yeah, Thursday yeah. works for me. That one's not online though. That's fine. As far as I'm aware. I'd rather do. I don't do yeah. online. I don't do that. Oh, who talk? Yeah. Bill, right? Harry. Harry. Yeah. Right. No yeah. problem. No, yeah. yeah. Harry's thinking about coming on uh, Thursday night. Right. Yeah. So it's six o'clock. Six o'clock. Yeah. Oh, and it's open, right? I mean, no, just gonna open the front door. Six o'clock Thursdays. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. That's right. the that's the one that I was attending before I moved. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm thinking about trying what what time of day and what day and what Saturday was good for me. Saturday was good for you. Saturday morning was good for you. Ten o'clock, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Susan right. uh Saturday is full here in the temple. I know, but we're gonna do this in the cottage. Where's the cottage? Uh, I've already talked to Lama about it. So, so the temple is coming up strong. Well, Very strong. Yeah, I think like all nonprofits we struggle right. during the COVID. I mean, it sure. was tough. Everybody lost a lot of revenue, and sure. So we just kind of hunkered down and um, are hoping that you know things will start picking up again now that we're open. Good. Yeah. Good. So yeah, no, I mean, it, it was not easy staying like Sure. Right. Here we are. <laughs> right. Still going. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, we're not going to fall by a long shot. Good. So, yeah. Good. 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 Okay. All right. So, uh, Thank you. You'll be online. I probably still have your email. For sure. Man. Yeah. Well, you won't remember. No, I'll look online. Yeah. I, I, I intend to come. On Thursdays. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. Thursdays. Yeah. 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 Daniel Harris. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Okay. Stay Thank well. you. Okay. You too. Bye, Harry. Bye, bye. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I, I've been very much interested. <laughs> Well, I think what I'm going to try to do is we also do it on the last There is a book by Ken McCloud called What the Food of Life. And it's almost secular in approach. And McCloud is a really renowned. 